Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the last uh, FUVEN uh, seminar this uh, academic year. And um, it's a real pleasure of having uh, Christina van der Wel uh, talking to us uh, today about her work. Um, so just um, a brief uh, introduction. Um, so she is associate professor in Southampton uh, in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And uh, she's an experimental fluid mechanician. Um, she specializes in optical uh, techniques, uh, laser-based diagnostics, wind tunnels, water tunnels. I think we'll see lots of that today. Um, and um, so Christina previously held a Marie Curie Fellowship and is currently a, a holds a UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship, which will run until 2023. Um, where she applies her research to study urban wind patterns and how air pollution spreads in cities. So with that, over to you, Christina. Brilliant. Thanks for the introduction. All right, now I'll, um, I'll share my screen. Okay, I got it to work before. Let's see if I can do it again. Yes, something's happening. Yeah, looking good. It's full screen. Yeah. Okay, I'll disappear. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to be invited today to be part of the, the Fuven Breathing City Seminar Series and to tell you about the research that we do at Southampton and the research that I'm doing as part of my Future Leaders Fellowship. So I'll be talking about how we use scale models in our wind tunnels and water tunnels in the lab to study how air pollution flows around cities and how we get pictures like this one on the screen, which is showing fluorescent dye flowing around a scale model in a water tunnel, simulating how air pollution flows through cities. And I just wanna add at this point that if you're interested in this sort of thing, um, please do say hi at the end of the seminar or contact me afterwards. And I love collaborating and I have had lots of positive experiences hosting visiting researchers to come do experiments at Southampton. So if this is something that you might wanna do, let me know. Um, I feel like this is the hardest part about talking online is not not having the chit chat. So I'll make sure that we have time to chit chat at the end. So the outline for my talk today is to first, I'll give a bit of a discussion about the current challenges in modeling air pollution to motivate why we need to do experiments. And then I'll talk about two case studies that we did at our labs at Southampton. The first one is an idealized fractal city model. And then the second one is a more realistic model with tall buildings in it. And then I'll reserve some time at the end uh, for a few slides to talk about some ongoing activities that we're doing. So current challenges in modeling air pollution. Well, I think we can all agree that air quality is important. Um, so here are some maps of the annual mean NO2 and the particulate matters, PM 2.5 and PM 10, uh, in the UK, um, and these are the 2019 data sets from uh, the UK Air website. And I've put on the maps a blue line to indicate the new World Health Organization guideline limits. And we can see that a large part of the UK, um, and particularly London, and, and the other big cities exceed these limits. So we care about air quality in the UK, we need to do something about this and uh, monitoring it and measuring it are the first steps to making plans. So how does um, the UK monitor, measure and forecast air quality? Well, the Met Office and DEFRA work together in the UK to provide air quality monitoring and forecasting. And so it's important for, to address our daily health, um, but also to, to monitor and make decisions about the future, as I said. So here is the forecast for today that I got off the UK Air website yesterday. And actually it looks pretty good in the UK. Um, and this is because of the variable weather that we've been having recently and it's providing nice clean air across the country and not letting air pollution build up. So this week is definitely a good week. Um, but how does the Met Office and DEFRA make these forecasts? Um, well, these bullet points are from the UK Air website describing how the forecasts are produced. So they're based on, um, some data sets of um, the emissions of pollutants, then they have models to 
cover the transport and dispersion of the pollutants by the winds, coupled with the weather uh, models that the Met Office do. And then they need chemical reaction models to, um, to model the reactive gases and aerosols and uh, models to, to say what the removal processes such as rain and deposition are doing. So there's a lot of layers of modeling going on here um, to make these forecasts. And the, the bit of this that I can help with is the transport and dispersion of pollutants by winds. Um, so this is something that I'm interested in as an aerodynamicist is how um, winds flow around complex environments like cities and how do they transport and disperse stuff as they flow. So this is important because, so as I said, the Met Office and DEFRA models um, use numerical weather prediction to, to make these forecasts. And these are essentially giant CFD models that wrap around um, the country and sometimes the globe. And you can imagine that the whole area is discretized into small grid cells. And then each grid cell is a control volume where the vertical exchange between levels is modeled as well as the horizontal exchange between columns. Now, the problem with this approach is that it's got limited resolution and it doesn't have a good ability to resolve local effects. So our models that the Met Office currently use um, go down to one kilometer by one kilometer cells, um, which seems fine when you look at this, the big picture, it's good for um, weather modeling, but it's not really good for um, knowing whether um, what's going on in the street scale. And when you have gr big grid scales like grid cells like this, you need to average um, the transport between the grid cells um, using averages, using models. So the fluxes are usually estimated based on the average terrain. And so you'll look in a grid cell and see, well, this is a, either an urban cell um, or it's a forest or it's water or it's sand, or they just pick an average and then um, have models to predict what the wind profiles and fluxes are gonna be based on that average. Um, but you can see this is a bit of a problem. And if I go back to the DEFRA's modeled air quality um, map and we zoom in on London um, and, and you can see Heathrow Airport there, with this resolution, Heathrow Airport's just um, about 10, 10 cells there. So can we really see the effect of um, different um, landing strips or, or different roads? Not really in this model. So this is where we need to improve our capability for the future is so going from what we can call the mesoscale perspective towards the microscale perspective. Now, I've taken this image um, from a really nice paper by Britta and Hannah showing that from the meso perspective, mesoscale perspective, what we do is we make these assumptions about the train and then say what the velocity profile is gonna be doing in the different um, atmospheric layers, but then we don't have details of what's going around the buildings and then the street scale. So this is where um, we need to make this jump to getting a better microscale perspective and resolving what's happening around buildings in street canyons and how this is affecting the air pollution that people, pedestrians are uh, experiencing at ground level um, in their day-to-day -day lives. And this was summarized nicely in a 2016 Met Office report where they said there's a so current need for new frameworks designed to treat heterogeneous surface exchange at scales ranging from 100 meters to a kilometer, so sub one kilometer scale. And they identified specifically that large eddy modeling and wind tunnel modeling are good routes for doing this. So I'm looking at the wind tunnel modeling side of things, but working with colleagues that do the large eddy modeling side of things to address this, um, this gap in our capability. So let's go to the case studies now, and I'll tell you all about the scale modeling that we're doing. We'll start with the idealized fractal city experiment that we did. And this was part of my Mary Curie fellowship actually. So the objective of the idealized fractal city um, experiments was to test this assumption of how well do homogeneous surface assumptions work when we have multi-scale distributions. 
So um, typically you'd make some assumptions about what is the average terrain in your one kilometer, one by one kilometer grid cell by measuring the average frontal solidity and plan form solidities of your urban cityscape. But buildings um, are not always built in nice rows at all exactly the same height. So what happens if we have a multi-scale city with some tall buildings, some small buildings, and what's the best multi-scale um, model that I could come up with? Well, it was a fractal. So I 3D printed a multi-scale uh, Sierpinski carpet fractal pattern with four building heights. Um, the largest building was one centimeter, and then the subsequent sizes were half that, half that, half that, down to 1.25 millimeters. And uh, the distribution followed the fractal dis distribution, so it has a power law in the number of those cubes. And then I took that same model and I randomized the arrangements. So I took the exact same number of buildings and then made four different random arrangements of those buildings with the same plan form solidity because it's the same buildings, but with varying frontal solidity, um, going from A to the having the most frontal solidity um, to B, C, D, having the least frontal solidity. So I can test specifically um, how the different arrangements of buildings in a terrain affect the flow properties. So I took these 3D printed models, I put them in our wind tunnel, um, I mounted it on a force balance to measure the drag, and then I used particle image velocimetry to illuminate the flow and measure the flow patterns in and around the buildings and above them and in their wake. And I did uh, two laser sheets. So in one case, I had the laser aligned with the streamwise wall normal direction. And then in another case, I, I rotated the laser sheet in to make a cross section of the wake in a stereo uh, configuration. I then did, uh, took the exact same models and put them in our water tunnel. And that gives us the capability of releasing fluorescent dye around the model to see how dispersion um, is affected by, the, by these buildings. So uh, concentrations are measured using a technique called planar laser induced fluorescence. And the idea is that the um, a fluorescent dye is released into the flow and the laser illuminates the fluorescent dye and the intensity that the fluorescent dye fluoresces is proportional to its concentration. So using a clever calibration method, we can back out quantitative maps, two-dimensional maps of the concentration field. And I'll show you, show you those in a few slides. And what's also clever is that the Reynolds number in a water tunnel is actually not too different than the Reynolds number we attain in the wind tunnel. Um, so the wind tunnel ran at, um, it was about 30 meters per second. Um, and the water tunnel, although it runs slower at only about half a meter per second, we have the advantage of the density, the greater density of water. So the Reynolds numbers are not too different and work out um, to be in the range of 5,000 to 10,000 based on the building height. Okay, so let's look at the wind tunnel results. Here are um, some nice, beautiful, colorful pictures of the particle image velocity symmetry measurements in that streamwise cross section and in the cross section of the wake. And these are uh, two instantaneous snapshots showing uh, red being the fast free stream and blue being the flow slow, the slow fluid that's retarded by the um, presence of the buildings. And we can better see what's going on by taking um, these maps of the velocity deficit. So looking at the streamwise plane first, uh, sub figure A is showing the, the effect of the buildings. So what I've done is taken the map of the flow when there are absolutely no buildings. And then I've taken the map of the flow when the buildings are present and subtracted them and looked at the difference. So this, this subplot A is the difference um, in the flow as a result of the buildings. And we can see that there's a, a small initial deflection around the leading edge when the flow hits this patch of buildings. 
And then there's an internal boundary layer that forms um, over top of the buildings, making a, a big wake in that flow. The subplot B is showing the turbulence, the additional turbulence intensity created by the buildings. So again, taking the map of turbulence intensity when there's absolutely no buildings, and then um, comparing that to the map of the turbulence intensity when the buildings are present. And so you can see that the buildings uh, are creating a lot more turbulence in the atmosphere, in the flow, and the edge of, the, of this um, added turbulence matches the edge of the internal boundary layer plotted by the wake. We can also see this in profiles of the velocity. And um, the blue circles are the velocity profile we get when there's no buildings, just a rough boundary layer. And then the other colors are the velocity profiles that we get measured above the patches. And we can see that the, um, the different cities have different total drags, which are offsetting these velocity profiles downwards with different amounts of delta U plus. So now looking at the, um, the cross sections in the wake, we can again plot the velocity deficit maps, um, the average velocity deficit maps behind each patch. And we can see the shape of the wake changes based on the different patches. So the, the spread out organized Sierpinski carpet uh, arrangement has a very broad spread out wake. And then the different random arrangements um, have wakes that narrow as the frontal solidity reduces. And we can compare this qualitatively to the quantitative drag measurements from the drag balance. And we can see that actually the total drag is ordered very quite nicely according to the frontal solidity. So I said the frontal solidity uh, increases, so D, C, B, A. And actually it shows that the, the predictions that we use based on frontal solidity are pretty good estimators of the total drag, because these four random patches do fall on the predicted line. But I think what's really interesting is that the Sierpinski carpet patch, so that's the one where all the buildings are arranged in the nice pattern in rows and columns, this one is an outlier. And so what that says to me is that actually our models work well when our buildings are randomly arranged, but the models don't work so well when our buildings are aligned um, in rows and columns, which sometimes is very characteristic of cities, isn't it? With buildings aligned in streets and avenues. So um, this is pointing out a problem with, with these assumptions. So the next thing I wanna show you are those fluorescent dye measurements around the patch. And this is, um, the picture from the cover slide of this presentation is showing the instantaneous concentration of the dye flowing in and around the buildings in the organized pattern, patch pattern, as well as below it, the average concentration um, of about a thousand images averaged together. And I have to plot the average concentration on a log scale because it, um, it diffuses and disperses so quickly actually. So, I can characterize the dispersion by the width of the plume, the average plume, and that's plotted here. So the red line is the plume boundary defined as 0.5% uh, of the source concentration. And if, as we expect um, with Gaussian plume models in the atmosphere, the plume spreads according to a power law. And what I think is really interesting is that the red line follows quite closely to the yellow line, which is the edge of the internal boundary layer that I defined using the wake um, velocity deficit in the particle image velocimetry velocity measurements. So I am curious whether the internal boundary layer of flows somehow modulates the extent of mixing in urban regions. And this is an open question that um, needs further research, in my opinion. So to summarize what we learned from that idealized fractal city uh, case study was that actually frontal and planform solidity are good predictors for drag and dispersion, which is quite reassuring. 
except when buildings have an organized pattern. So we need to keep that in mind specifically when we're looking at um, urban regions. And then finally, that uh, there's some internal, the internal boundary layer does appear to somehow modulate the extent of dispersion, um, which might need further research to, to better understand. And if you're interested in this, we published this, these results in boundary layer meteorology in 2019. So the next case study I'm going to talk about now is a more realistic case study that, um, that had tall buildings in the case study. And this is a collaboration with the University of Reading and also with Imperial College London. And what was great, it was uh, one of these visits that I mentioned. So it was a special research visit, um, which had researchers from Reading come to Southampton to help perform the experiments. And that was supported by the UK Fluids Network um, research visits when they had those special grants. So here's a, mo a CAD model of the realistic model that we studied and used in these experiments. And this is a, uh, this is a real city in Beijing where they're looking to build a whole bunch of new tall buildings. And we wanted to see how the added, the new tall buildings affected the flow in this previously quite low rise neighborhood. So the objectives of this study were to first see the impact of the tall buildings on the wind flow structure and the dispersion. We also wanted to compare different model sizes this time. So we, we printed models in two different sizes to see how important the Reynolds number was. And this time we did simultaneous velocity measurements using particle image velocimetry and concentration measurements using planar laser induced fluorescence. And so that let us uh, explore the data a little bit more, which I'll show you in the results in a moment. Um, and here's, here's a picture of that 3D printed city in the water tunnel, uh, illuminated by the laser and with the camera system uh, shown there in the corner. So the plane that's being illuminated is the center plane uh, cutting through the model, which you can see highlighted in green in the CAD model on the right side of the screen. So what do we, the results look like? Well, here are the particle image velocity results. Um, on the top is the mean velocity, and on the bottom is the turbulent velocity variance. Um, so no subtracting has been going on here. These are the absolute values. And we can see the mean velocity, the flow is red, so um, fast in the free stream, and then it's blue and very much retarded by the, um, by the presence of the buildings. And um, especially the, the very first building that the flow impacts in this cross section um, very much makes deflects the, um, the flow upwards. So what you need to keep in mind is that um, particle image velocimetry, the measurements, the first building that you see in this image is actually um, in front of the plane. So it, that's why it looks like the flow is going behind it and then it's being deflected by the second building in the, which is very much in the plane and making this big deflection of the flow. And we can see that in the turbulent velocity variance map as well, is that the second building, which is the one that's in the plane of measurement, deflects the flow upwards and kicks up quite a bit of turbulent um, variance in that region of the flow. So what we imagine is going on is very similar to this sketch um, by a paper by Wang in 2006. And we imagine that at the base of these buildings, there's quite a lot of um, ground turbulence that's, that's being produced, but it's the rooftop shear layer created by the tip vortices of the flow going over the top of these buildings that's making tip vortices and contributing a lot to the turbulent velocity variance we see at roof, roof levels. So how does this affect the concentration? Here are the concentration maps. On the top right is the mean concentration map. We can see that the, uh, the pollutant that we introduce sticks to the ground mostly as it uh, approaches the building. And then as, the, as it approaches the building from the left, it impacts the building and there suddenly spreads out quite, quite um, deeply above the building and dilutes itself uh, quite a lot 
behind in the wake of the building. The tur and the bottom right image is the turbulent scalar flux. And this is something that we can calculate because we have simultaneous concentration and velocity measurements. And this is the correlation between the vertical velocity fluctuation and the concentration fluctuation. And this is really highlighting that um, it's the rooftop shear layer that is contributing the most vertical turbulent flux uh, in the wake of the building. And we can see that with this, the big yellow um, jet coming off the top of that building. Let's now compare the two model sizes that we printed. So these are the results from uh, comparing the one to 2400 scale model to the one to 4800 scale model. Uh, so they've all been normalized by the model size. So the map should look the same. And I'm quite satisfied that they do look fairly the same. Um, so the mean velocity in the top row, both are consistent showing the initial deflection by the by the tall building. The mean concentration shown in the middle row are also showing similar characteristics with the big deflection by that tall building. And the scalar fluxes, the turbulent scalar fluxes in the bottom row are both highlighting that the it's the rooftop shear layer that's the dominant mechanism of vertical exchange um, in the wake above the buildings. So that's quite satisfying to see that the Reynolds number effect and the scale effect isn't too important and that we capture the, the same physical mechanisms in both cases. And then um, also lastly, we compared with some clever LES simulations done by Martin Van Roik and Tom Grills at Imperial College based on the U Dallas code. And we have the mean velocity map on the top left from the experiment compared to the mean velocity map from the large eddy simulation on the bottom. And it's nice that we can finally see behind that building that was making a shadow. And we see that there's a, it is the second building that is actually in the plane that's creating this large deflection in the flow um, consistent with the experiment in LAS, which shows that um, the experiments are good and also sh gives us confidence in the LES that it's capturing the right physical phenomena. And what's really great about computer simulations is that you can make these images like we have on the right hand side, which are three dimensional contours of the mean concentration. Uh, the contour in subplot A is a slightly higher concentration contour than this contour level chosen in subplot B, but both show the where the where the concentration is originating from upstream of the city. And also both show that they, the plume spreads roughly Gaussian-like mm -hmm. until it hits that first building. And then there's whoosh, a big ventilation into the atmosphere. So to summarize what we learned from that case study is that the, it was really the rooftop shear later that's the dominating feature in these um, urban geometries that drives the vertical fluxes. And it was reassuring that the flow around the tall buildings doesn't seem too sensitive to the incoming flow conditions. And um, we we're quite pleased that this was recently published just earliest, earlier this year in Experiments in Fluids. Okay, so um, I just have a few slides left now to tell you about where we're going with this research. So we recently moved um, just 10 minute walk down the road from our old campus to um, our old campus was Highfield campus in Southampton and we're now at Boulderwood Innovation Campus, um, also in Southampton, and we've built a new recirculating water tunnel in our um, in our labs here and here's me and some of our team being being very excited about the new facility and a project that I have running now is that we're trying to make new false floor set up to um, make bespoke velocity profiles in this water tunnel. So we're using spires and roughness um, built on false floors that we lay on the bottom of the tunnel, very much like the dew and wind tunnels, um, to make this bespoke boundary layer profiles that are aimed to uh, simulate the actual velocity profiles that we see in the atmospheric boundary layer. 
And we're finding that uh, it's a little bit more challenging to do in a water channel than it is in a wind tunnel, um, but it's definitely having, having an effect, which is very promising because if we can thicken the boundary layer, it means we can build larger models and have more detailed uh, measurements with higher resolution. And the reason we want to do this is because we will be modeling Southampton. We're going to take a one kilometer by one kilometer domain of Southampton, but, uh, focusing on the docks in the city center. And we're gonna print that at um, in, in one meter by one meter uh, 3D printed uh, scale. So one to a thousand scale. And we're gonna put that in our water tunnel to look at the flow patterns over the city and how uh, pollution is transported over the city. Mm -hmm. And luckily in Southampton, the predominant wind direction is uh, southwesterly. So we have flow coming over the water and um, perhaps it was a little bit controversial to say, but one of the main sources of air pollution is the docks. So we're gonna have our source of air pollution at the docks and see um, how it's impacted, impacting the city. And um, with that, I can conclude and I'll shamelessly plug my new book. Um, and if you're interested in turbulent flows, I encourage you to look up um, this new book that I've written with Ian Castro. Um, and to please get in touch with me if, um, if you're interested in any of this work, I'm happy to talk about it. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Christina. Um, so we'll now take some questions. Um, so there's already a few in the in, in the chat. Um, so, oh, excellent. Perhaps, um, well, I'll ask the people to ask the question themselves. So, um, Dave W, um, do you want to ask one of your questions? I see you've got two. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's basically relating to the the use of the building and the influence of the temperatures from those buildings. So I was just curious to know what um, <coughs> assessment has been made for the potential, potential impact on the flow and dispersion from the different temperatures that's liable to be associated with each building. And, and, a, how, and how are the emissions from the buildings themselves taken into account when you're looking at concentrations? That's a re really good question. And I think you've um, definitely highlighted the limitation of doing experiments. So. In the water tunnel, we assume that all the uh, pollution is passive. So we're not able to capture the physics of the temperature differences. But there are ways to get around that. Um, we can inject the air pollution to have some vertical momentum initially. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the effects of having a, a hot source, for example. Um, and we're also quite careful about uh, how many sources we have, because I think it very quickly complicates the situation. So up to date, we've focused on one source and tracking that. Um, but I think you're talking about whether we could do more than one source. Yeah. And I think that would be a lot of fun, but also a big challenge. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, there was also Rock Kinnisley. Hello there. Uh, thanks for that, Christina. It's great stuff. It's good to know that uh, tunnels are still in existence when so many of them have been closed down. Uh, I had two, two some quite generic questions. One is about um, you've looked at one fractal dimension in your Sapinski carpet. Have you any insights into what effect different fractal dimensions would have on the airflow and dispersion? Well, I think um, as I'm doing more and more studies, I'm realizing that it's the uh, largest scale objects in the train that have a really dominating influence. Mm. Um, one of the things that we did with that fractal study, and I didn't have time to show it, is that I printed it again with all the smallest scales deleted just mm -hmm. to see the effect, what the effect was. And it, um, it changed the total drag by less than 5% and was um, had very minimal effect on the dominant physics. So um, I would say that 
yeah, it's the dominant, uh, like the large scales that are really dominating what's happening in the flow. Mm. And it's uh, maybe reassuring for people doing simulations that actually I don't think you need to do all super fine scale um, resolution of all the minute details of buildings um, because they don't have a, a large effect on um, on those scales. That's jolly good news, actually. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a community who wonder about the role of you know, the landscape scale, uh, natural landscape scale, whether you can use fractal dimension to um, predict uh, rates of deposition from the atmosphere, which are driven by turbulence uh, scales and it sounds encouraging that we could look at that without having to put every every molehill and uh, wart on the landscape in the uh, simulation. Shall I ask my other question Martin or do you want to move on to something um, else? Yeah why not yeah yeah it was just really that you, you've done all this with um, LES as, as one might expect so I'm just wondering how capable just a sort of a RANS model and a, you know something that isn't resolving um, um, individual eddies would be at simulating a lot of these effects. Is it a sort of diminishing returns thing as you go to more and more complex CFD? Um, no, I, I think RANS is a really important place to play in all this um, mm. because it's it's faster. You can't just yeah. um, do these highly resolved uh, simulations for everything, yeah. but it has problems. And um, one of the problems that I'm focusing on uh, with my research is the fact that RANS models assume that the uh, turbulent diffusivity is homogeneous and isotropic. Mm. Um, and I'm finding that it isn't. Yeah. So one of the reasons I'm doing these high fidelity simulations is to really um, measure the turbulent diffusivity directly to then see if we can uh, inform RANS models uh, to make them a little bit more clever and a little bit more accurate. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, again. That's just what I wanted to hear. That's fantastic. Because coming from us, from a government uh, perspective, you know, we're looking to use more complex tools than just ADMS um, because some of the challenges we're seeing now are complex sites. We've done all the easy big stacks from power station sort of problems, and now we're looking at dispersion of pollutants at more or less ground level in the middle of an industrial estate. I'm wondering how on earth we can. Um, regulate those or even just predict where to monitor those um, mm. so yeah I'll, uh, I'll watch with interest where that goes excellent it sounds like I need to listen to your research as well uh, we, we should have a chat afterwards <laughs> certainly because uh, again we've been modeling um, albeit just with RANS over that sort of well, not quite a kilometer scale but fairly large scale and there's so much resistance to the um, to the plausibility of doing this. You know, I'm fighting years and years of, oh, no, no, CFD is far too complex for regulatory flows. But, you know, we, we, we have the digital elevation models now for large parts of the UK. So it's quite easy to get the vertical structures. Um, and as long as we're using RANS rather than LES, you know, the computing capability is on, you know, most people's desktops these days. So uh, that's that's why I'm particularly interested in that route. Uh, but I won't hog you anymore. I'll uh, I'll perhaps catch up with you later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? You can unmute or raise your hand. Yes, I see James. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, the, the question I have is that uh, the, the, uh, the, the models seem to use um, completely permeable buildings, as far as I can tell. Um, and we know that pollutants can enter buildings and stay in them and come out, but I don't know to what extent that would have an effect on, on, the, on the dynamics of the plume. Do you think that would be a, a negligible effect or would it have an effect? In, and further to that, other ways to develop the, the experiments that, that could be included. Um, yes, so the buildings are completely impermeable. Um, there's no flow going in and out of them in these models. And I don't think um, the e ingress and egress um, inside buildings has a strong effect on atmospheric flows, but the opposite is true, isn't it? So the atmospheric flows have a strong um, effect as the boundary conditions of what's going on inside buildings. So I think it's 
the opposite question is important. Uh, the future of research is gonna be looking at what goes on inside buildings and how these external um, predictions are, are the boundary conditions or possibly coupled and linked to what's going on inside buildings. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that does, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, it, it's, yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Christos. Thanks, Martin. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, very interesting talk. I was wondering, it's out of curiosity mainly, um, if there is any any work on the uh, how realistic the uh, the uh, the modeled um, arrangement, geometric arrangements you have been discussing in the first part of uh, the presentation, the fractal ones. Uh, if there is any correspondence to the real uh, to, to real cities, real uh, geometry, real arrangements, and uh, yeah, if they are how 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 do they correspond? Thanks. Well, that's right. That was the initial motivation for printing a, a fractal city is that there are some papers out there in the literature saying that um, urban sprawl can be characterized by um, fractal parameters. So we see like the city center and then like suburbs generated around cities and how that sort of um, that sprawl has been characterized with fractals. And this is the motivation of trying to do this. Um, but I, th I, we saw that the, the conclusion was that actually the small scales don't seem to have a large uh, impact. So I'm not sure I'm going to um, go in that direction quite much more, if that makes sense. OK, thanks. Um, Dave, do you want to ask your other question, perhaps? To be fair, I think it was answered by one of the previous questions, because it was basically relating to the impact of uh, a large body of water near the area. And I think that's covered by what you'd said about the, the height of the building being dominant. All right, OK. Um, and I've got a question, Christina, um, and perhaps... Um, one which uh, which which is well, it's about it's about drag, right? Because you've got you're saying uh, that that drag is kind of dominated or or is is kind of created by the largest obst obstacles in flow, and and the smaller ones don't matter so much. Is the same true for the turbulence, kinetic energy, etc.? Because the the dispersion might be affected by other processes, right? Because we are kind of the, the momentum you've got pressure and pressure is non-local and that and that's what creates that drag essentially but that that equivalent mechanism doesn't exist in uh, in scalar transport so so do you do you also see that observation in um, in the in, in the turbulence kinetic energy that's a good question um well, I think in the tall building case, it was very clear it was the tall building that kicked up the most amount of turbulence um, at that elevated height. Um, and it's the small buildings contribute more to the ground level action that's going on. Um, but when you're talking about like ventilating air pollution from ground level out of a city, you need a good good transport mechanisms at all levels, don't you? Yeah, you do. Yeah. yeah. No, that's right. And, and it might be that it's that it's kind of the external, the, 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 what, the, what, what happens, say, with the boundary layer is, is kind of one processing. What happens in between the buildings is dominated by smaller local obstacles or something. And it's a kind of an interesting thing because there, there is no equivalent to pressure in, in concentration. Um, Alison. Uh, was it, yeah, that was a good question. I was just thinking about it um, in terms of the way we looked at this, um, which was in a more empirical way. But what our, our interpretation was that the small buildings are sheltered and they tend to be within the weights of the larger buildings, and hence they don't contribute to the drag um, by anything like this. So, so that's consistent with what Christina was saying. But I, so I don't know whether that's consistent with them contributing less to turbulent to energy production. I'm not sure. It may well be because because the uh, wind speeds would would be lowered. 
Yes. Yes. And it depends where your source height is, I suppose, as well. What, where it's important to have those um, fluctuations. Yeah, I mean, I think because uh, we tend to be looking at this from the sort of over overhead perspective, don't we? Sort of more of a, how does it contribute to longer range transport across the city? But actually, at street scale, um, you know, even traffic going along the street can have a massive influence on, on turbulence reduction. So. At street scale, there's, there's a lot of small scale processes that contribute to the There are two different questions, I think, aren't there? I'm not sure that made sense. Yeah. I really like everything you said. And I think they're all open questions. So, I mean, the Met Office might be interested in knowing, you know, how the city contributes to transport across the city at the Bosnian scale, but actually, we might, you know, we might also be interested in the several metre scale of what happens within the street canyon, and that that is that's a whole different set of processes. I think. Rob, yeah, I'd certainly agree with uh, Alison. Hi, Alison. Um, that multiple scales could well be important. Um, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, we're interested in what might be you know, small or point sources, which are actually down within the. Um, canopy if you like of the of the city and, and perhaps there's the scope for um, variable scales being important you know with close to the source there being this you know everything down to the tiniest scale those mole hills are mentioned and then as you get further away perhaps the um, you can chop off um, progressively large fractions of the total um, landscape I guess it's like an adaptive mesh, basically, in the in the CFD. Uh, whether that's feasible? We've been talking about this for about twenty years, haven't we? That never actually been cracked, has it? No, <laughs> no. But Christina's going to crack it for us, yes. so that's good news. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do my best. Yeah. Tom. Hello. Um, I follow up. Uh, the question and the response. The small scale turbulence is important or not? Uh, actually, this also for the drug depends on uh, um, what you're looking into, right? So assume if you can model the tall building, bigger building properly, and you can uh, capture the big structure or eddies, that means you can get the drug more or less right. And uh, that means the big flow pattern is right. And uh, you may lose some details of the small dispersions inside somewhere, but the overall picture, mainly due to the convection, is right. They were there. All right. Um, any other questions, comments? No, of not, um, then uh, let us thank uh, Christina again. Um, so thank you very much, Christina. And, and thank you to everybody who had really insightful comments. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. Um, I've got one announcement to make, uh, which is that, um, so this is the last uh, FUVEN seminar uh, of this academic year, we'll reconvene next year. But next year, at this time, there will be a, uh, a Clean Air Networks conference. Let me see if I can share screen at uh, the University of Birmingham. So this is the 5th and 6th of July. Um, and this is all six uh, NERC uh, air quality networks, so BioNet, Breathing City, uh, Clean Air for V, the HACOM, the MPL um, network, and the SAQN. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, in Tapas and, and Transition, of course, MPL is, uh, is of course, one of the organizations. Um, so, uh, so please, please join us uh, in, in this if you're, if you're interested, and, um, and have, a, have a great day and um, holiday otherwise. <laughs>